Hello, and welcome to this edition of the Eric Miskell Show. Um, I'm Eric Miskell with EMS Now, and uh, thanks for joining today. For we're, we're doing one of our updates on the EMS industry in Mexico. Mexico, of course, is one of the key regions for electronics manufacturing globally. Um, before I introduce our guests, let me just cover some housekeeping issues real quick. Uh, not a housekeeping issue, but a greeting to, as always, my co-host is Phil Stoughton, joining us from Australia today. Um, if you're listening in if uh, live, you will be muted and you will remain muted for the duration of this. If you wish to pose any questions to the panel, please do so using the question uh, tab at the bottom of the screen. And as always, this is being recorded and will be rebroadcast on EMS now and will be there forever. So share it with all your friends. Um, our guest today, uh, coming back coming back for a third or fourth time, I think, is Ivan Romo. He's a director of SmartSol Technologies. And our first time guest is Miguel Acosta. He's the country manager with MacroFab. So gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. I want to give you each an opportunity to kind of introduce yourselves and kind of the, your role and experience within the electronics industry in Mexico. And Miguel, since you are the first time guest, you get to go first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric, for the invitation and Phil. Uh, yep, well, um, my name is uh, Miguel Acosta. I'm currently country manager for Macrofab. I have been in this position for two and a half years, more or less. Uh, started when the pandemic was about to start also. So it was a, a funny to, uh, time to start a, a new position, but uh, here we are. Well, I started my career in the electronics industry around 2008. At that time, as a, I was a, a, an intern at a Siemens Video, was a automotive uh, branch for Siemens. And then uh, this company was acquired, or this branch was acquired by Continental Automotive. So uh, I kept my, my, my career in the electronics uh, industry. I have been there. I have been uh, rolling uh, from positions from engineering, uh, manufacturing, engineering, uh, planning. Then I, I moved to the commercial area, uh, uh, Icor. Uh, Icor is a, a company, or at that time was a company from Spain. As I moved there as a key account management, and then I started to move into more commercial and sales position in other companies. So okay. that's uh, basically my background, and I'm an uh, electronics engineer. So well, the uh, background, the, the non-use background is there, but yeah. nevertheless, it's always helpful to understand a little bit of, of the how it works. But now we need to focus on more on supply chain and improving costs for our customers. And yeah. Thank Good. you. Thank you, thank you. Ivan, sir. Uh, hi, Gil, Eric, and, and Miguel. Nice to be again with you. Uh, well, as you know, I'm, I have 26 years of experience in the electronic assembly industry. Um, more than 11 uh, when I uh, was the founder of SmartSol. I'm still like as the general manager in SmartSol Mexico. SmartSol has operation in, in Mexico, United States, uh, Central and South America. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, my my uh, career background is in the educational uh, manufacturing op uh, operations management, engineering, and, and basically uh, uh, since 2003, on sales and uh, operations management for the supplies for equipment, uh, mainly in Mexico. Uh, uh, my uh, career is electronic and computing engineering, but I recently finished my uh, master's degree in uh, industrial cost management, and I'm in process to get a second degree in finance. Wow. Always, every day is a school day, Ivan. <laughs> yes, <laughs> almost every day. <laughs> Life learner. That's very good. Yeah, congratulations. So let's Thank start you. kind of big picture with Mexico. Uh, just we're beginning second quarter now, or we're into the second quarter now. But if you can just kind of reflect back on 2022 and maybe, you know, what we've seen so far at the beginning of 2023, kind of how do you characterize, you know, the markets in Mexico over this time? Um, Ivan, why don't I begin with you, sir? 
Okay. Well, uh, if I would like to share with you some hard numbers about that, according with the INEGI, who is the National Institute of Statistics and Geography uh, for Mexico. The manufacturing uh, industry for electronics and similar industries on, to, on, on 2022, uh, it was about 140,000 new jobs in Mexico. So wow. that represents 4.5% uh, of the total jobs of the exportation industry. Uh, so it was a good uh, number. It was, uh, I mean, 4.5 increase of the total people working in this industry. So it was a good number. The major growth that uh, uh, the industry has, it was in, in five states, Baja California, Nuevo León, Tamaulipas, Chihuahua, and Jalisco. As you know, Smartson, the headquarters is in Jalisco, and that represents 25% of the new jobs. Uh, so it was a well balance between the five states, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, just uh, uh, sharing some uh, numbers from the Jalisco state, the exportations went up near to 21% on the 2022. Uh, however, as you know, our company shows a growth of 67% uh, compared with the 2021. So in general, 2022, it was a, a good year. Mm -hmm. uh, as we were talking uh, uh, before to start, 80% of the total investment of the EMS company came from five big companies uh, that are the, the large global EMS. Three are from the United States and two from Taiwan. So what makes this difference between the previous five years and the last five years is that we start uh, seeing more investment from the Taiwanese companies into Mexico. So uh, in general, we can say that uh, the 2022 uh, it was a very good year in general for Mexico. Excuse Miguel, me. how do you say that? Well, uh, in my personal experience, what I have seen uh, in, in these uh, past months is that more and more companies uh, from Asia and from the United States are trying to locate their operations here in Mexico, right? Uh, this is by a merging or acquisition or even starting from scratch. Uh, of course, these, these uh, companies are trying to, to merge or acquire something already uh, operational and equal, mostly because of the uh, logistics things. We have this uh, IMEX certification that is required for the importation uh, of temporal goods. So this is, you need to have this in order to operate and avoid some taxes in Mexico. So what I have seen is most of the companies are looking for uh, acquire or uh, an already working operation. So yeah, more and more companies are, are, are looking and yeah. not only for, for setting up the operation here, but looking for partnerships, suppliers, vendors. They're looking to, to establish a better uh, operation out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's substantial growth. Ivan, I just wanted to go back to what you mentioned. You talked about the top five being 80%. My sense when I look at the global CapEx market is it's those top five, particularly the ones of those that are in the US that are perhaps slowing a little bit in their CapEx this year or being a little bit more cautious than they have been, whilst the tier two seems to be going pretty well. Is that the sense you have in Mexico as well? Well, yes, uh, you know, basically when you have a, a large capital investment one year, you need to improve the efficiency of those assets in the next mm. year. So that will be reduced at least for three up to five months at the beginning of the year to, in order to get the, the efficiency because you know that a lot of the uh, current product like the automotive, the qualification and certification process takes a while. So they have the assets doing nothing for a while while, while the, the product is being released. So uh, usually Q1 of the year is, is where most of the companies in the automotive are trying to, to get qualified in order to get the, the release for the mass production. Okay. And you see that as the main driver of that? You don't see any overall softening in demand? Uh, no, not really. I mean, we, we see that there is a lot of uh, new companies setting up operations in Mexico. The mm -hmm. non-traditional ones, uh, uh, a small tier two, tier three coming from Asia. So it's the, 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 the good movement that we see. And we mm -hmm. still uh, see a lot of the uh, relocation of production from the traditional American uh, EMS mm -hmm. into Mexico, moving out production from Asia into Mexico. 
Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Miguel, what you do with Macrofab in, in terms of finding manufacturing partners for US companies, um, are you seeing a much higher demand for Mexico than, than you perhaps saw at the beginning of your tenure two years ago? Yes, of course. Uh, what we have seen, what we have seen uh, these uh, past months is that more at the beginning, uh, two years ago, it was uh, just quote the, uh, the, the U.S. Doesn't matter. We're okay with uh, quoting U.S. But right now, all the uh, mainly all, all the projects are they, they want to explore the Mexico option, right? They want to know if the volume that they have is enough for getting in, uh, in, a, in a factory in Mexico. They want to know about buying, getting the material in Mexico. They want to know about the, 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 all the logistics costs involved in this, both importing the material here, exporting, and all the logistics. So they are now uh, finding out that Mexico is a very viable option in regards of everything that uh, is cost. Yeah, Mexico is being mm. very cost efficient. And they also have yeah. a lot of talent, right? We have found a lot of people, very talented people in some of our partner factories. So we are well aware that uh, when we get more jobs here, most of those new customers are wanting to explore the Mexico option. Yeah. So what what's driving that too? I think of you know everything that goes on in the industry, and we talk about we've talked about like you've all both indicated new companies coming in and trying to begin. We also have kind of you know um, reshoring, nearshoring, whatever you wish to call the trend, right? Manufacturing coming back and. To some degree, there's the whole political strife that goes on in different regions that's forcing it. How do you, where do you see it mostly coming from? What do you think accounts for the, for the increase? By the way, and also I think Mexico is a fantastic place to be manufacturing electronics and has been, it's world-class. So is this just the right time? Yes, of course, the relationship between United States and Mexico is still very strong. Uh, besides the current governments, uh, the relationship between companies, uh, the laws, uh, the, the people is, is very strong. So uh, usually moving the production into Mexico is to do a big the risk uh, of having everything into Asia. So uh, and the, 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 the good thing that the, all the American companies are trying to to balance uh, their investments into the world, bidding uh, uh, more for Mexico. And of course, the big Taiwanese that, that, that are also involved in some political issues with China, they are taking the advantage, the advantage of Mexico near to the United States, like the largest uh, uh, consumer market. So they are uh, relocating and opening a lot of uh, new facilities into Mexico in order to do the same strategy. New shoring and the risk of the current production capabilities. Miguel, what's your opinion on that? As Ivan was mentioning, uh, yeah, it, so one of the most important things is kind of uh, taking risk out of uh, Asia. What we have also been looking at is, for example, one of the reasons that uh, we are uh, manufacturing to Mexico is we have seen that we can avoid some tariffs uh, out of the United States. If you move the materials directly to Mexico, mm -hmm. you transform the, the product here, you make the transformation, you make the assemblies here, and then you, you ship back to the US. You are, uh, you are skipping some tariff that if you try to manufacture this directly into the United States or bringing just the assembly done from China, you are gonna be paying some tariff that this goes from 10 to 25 percent so that's a lot in regards of cost mm. so yeah so mexico remains very competitive and it always has been and i think it's it's competitive nature and its capacity make it the ideal place and i guess the two movements are you go from the us to mexico because volumes are high enough to um justify being offshore and at the moment the mexico feels like a better choice than um than China possibly, and then the other thing is the friend shoring, ally shoring, whatever you want to call it. Um, Mexico seems Mexico seems a better option for that. With all that growth, though, surely there are some challenges in terms of um, pressure on talent, those kind of things. And there were there was some substantial uh, growth in in wages um, in the last twelve months. There was a rise in the minimum wage. Is that what started that whole process? But it feels like maybe more than 10% in terms of wage rises? 
Ivan, yes, but, uh, but uh, nobody of the electronic assembly industries are being driven by the minimum wages. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we are using a different parameters. Usually we use what is the inflation and the previous year to do the salary increases. And of course, to do the compensation on salary adjustment based on the performance and the growth of the individual growth of the people. Uh, there are some, uh, I mean, if, if we compare uh, from three years ago, the total inflation in Mexico is kind of a 25%. Uh, so of course, most of that has been reflected into the salary of the people. And mm -hmm. okay, uh, right now, the strongest of the peso, the exchange rate peso dollar, is affecting us also. But uh, and so, so we are having, a, a, compared with three years ago, like a 40, 45 percent salary increase of that. But wow. of course, all people is, is being more productive. They know how to do more. And of course, the increase of the business that we are having is compensating that salary increase. Yeah. Miguel, do you think Mexico generally has become more efficient and less dependent on low-cost labor, more automation, more digital transformation in those EMS facilities? Some of the companies are trying to be more technological and depend less on the operation or the, the, the personal, but the reality, or at least what we have seen, uh, what we have seen here with our our, our uh, at the industry here and with our partner factories is that they do depend on the talented people, right? Mm -hmm. So some companies, we know, we all know that the wages are going up, not only for the operational part or also for the administrative personnel. So uh, we need to be aware that the more competitors or more industries or more companies are in Mexico or in Maria, of course, mm -hmm. the salaries are going to be going up, right? Because right now, what we have seen is we need to be very aggressive to be able to retain our talent here. And of course, it's not only about uh, having the correct wage, but having the correct benefits and having the mm -hmm. correct culture within the company, right? Yeah. Uh, not all the people is interested just in, 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 the, in the salary, right? We have seen here, here at Macrofab, we have seen that there are some people, they they are willing to be trained. They, are, they want to grow professionally. They want to have a chance to study another language. They want to be trained on ITC and have their certification. So that's very motivational for uh, uh, the people here, at least here in the area or at least in my company. We have seen that. Yeah, certainly in Guadalajara, I think that career development and uh, and just the development of that huge talent pool, you know, it's more than 100,000 people employed in the industry of one city. Um, it makes sense that they would want to, you know, develop their career and, and reach higher levels. Just before I hand back to Eric, I wanted to just on digital transformation, Ivan, that's always good news for you because that's investment in software and hardware and, and CapEx. Are you seeing people investing in strategies that get more out of the headcount they've got? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the the total uh, vision of the industry is how to use the people in um, most value add activities. So basically using more digitalization, uh, software uh, management that helps to review the headcounts, to do a preventive uh, activities instead of corrective situations in the manufacturing floor. So that, that is a, a huge one movement right now. Uh, we are going to see that uh, day over day, more and more and more. Of course, every company is setting up their automation uh, divisions in order to, to do an internal supply of that solution, but also working with many integrators and many suppliers of the industry. As Miguel mentioned before, the that the companies are trying to avoid the use of the tariff uh, for the Chinese products, we see another big movement in Mexico uh, that it was not before. Uh, a lot, as you know, a lot of the uh, big uh, companies doing capital equipment went out uh, from the United States or from Europe and went into China maybe 15, 20 years ago. So right now we, we see four companies setting them up operations in Mexico to do the assembly of the big machine. Okay. So that is a, a good thing for us also, mm. because that machine will be supplied for the American market with no tariff, 
and of course will increase the level of complexity that we have in the in the assembly of the products in Mexico. That's a really good sign, Ivan. Yes, it is. No, it is. You know, there's a lot here that you can, that we can unpack. So many of these issues. Uh, we don't. Um, let me start with going back to the regional piece. You know, Ivan, when you said that uh, of the the five uh, uh, states right. that were, were the growth, and you know, I think of Mexico and the, you know, you you sort of the Guadalajara, the the Monterrey, and then kind of the border all along there. Is it developing in any other places yet at all, or is it? Are there, are there up and coming areas for Mexico for manufacturing? Yeah, uh, for example, the Bajio, the Querétaro, Silao, Celaya region has been mm -hmm. a very uh, constant growth, especially uh, from companies from Europe, uh, automotive uh, segments. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, the automotive segment is not growing so fast now, it's the conversion to the uh, electrical mm -hmm. vehicles. But uh, th that company is still growing at the level of uh, 5 to 10 percent every year. Uh, uh, that is a very spread territory. No big companies, with the exception of two, but most of the companies are from three to 10 lines, mm -hmm. uh, medium size. And, and that's why uh, when we see the, the nationwide numbers, they are not uh, in, in the top five. But of course, it should be uh, number six or seven, the, okay. the Bajio region. Okay, that's interesting. And, and Miguel, I was going to ask you on the uh, when you're placing when when, when Macrofab is placing right uh, manufacturing down there and helping to uh, OEMs to do that. Do you do you track that the the the, the staffing issues and who some companies because. Some may be having issues. Some may be, you know, less staff than others. They may not be quite as uh, automated yet as some other ones. Are those factors that you have to kind of consider in your placement of that? Yes, we need to check on uh, well, first that the, the factory that we're trying to engage for each project has the uh, the capacity, the install capacity to do our project, right? Then we need to double check on their technical capabilities to, to check again if it's matching with what the project is requiring. Mm -hmm. And But also besides checking kind of just the numbers, we, we make an audit because we need to make sure that they have not only the, the appropriate machinery and the space to produce our project, but that they have everything, the systems and everything uh, on site to be uh, productive and to have uh, the, the project and the product delivered with quality. So yeah, we double check on the staffing that they have, what the structure, the organizational chart that they have. So yeah, we double check on that, and we're very strict on where, uh, which factories who are working with for each project. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much a full audit that you would do as an OEM, I guess, um, and you're doing it on their behalf at multiple sites down there. Yeah, and do you see any? You know, when I was in Guadalajara last summer and I visited various EMS, you know, kind of the impression I got was there's a tiering just by size, but also of of preference from a work, you know, they're, the top ones are, are maybe more desirable to work for than the smaller ones. And so there's a lot of movement and uh, competition for that within it. Um, and so a lot of the smaller ones I spoke to talked about the importance of culture too, making sure it's a good workplace, making sure they're taking care of their people because maybe they can't offer as high a price, but they can make it maybe a better work environment. Do you see that's continuing, that being a factor? Yes. Uh, uh, talking about also about the smaller factories, what we have seen, and I mean, I have seen this in two years that I have been in Macrofab. When I started here, I just knew a few uh, small factories. Now I'm seeing a lot of small factories that emerging new companies, uh, uh, privately held Mexican owned uh, companies. And yes, what I have seen is that these are, this is people that they want to thrive in regards of the business. These are experienced people that they know the industry. They want to, they know that they can uh, uh, have some business here and make the company grow. I have seen that. I hmm. I have worked in the past. I used to work at a, uh, this company, Signet Technologies. Right now, is not uh, it, it shut out the, their business during COVID. But this was a Mexican private health company. Hmm. Yes, the culture is very important. You need to be aware of the potential of the company, and you need to kind of be able to spread 
that willing to thrive in the industry. So yes, having the correct people, the correct mindset, and the, the correct target ambition, it's very important. Not yeah. only at a CEO level, but also kind of uh, be able to share that vision with your team. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? It would be interesting to see what a large domestic um, EMS company looks like. One's yet to break through, but um, do you think that's something that will happen in the next in the next few years, Ivan? Or do you see the market being dominated by kind of North American and Asian companies that that seem to be entering the region more and more? Yeah, uh, it's going to be a balance. Uh, of course, local companies will not be or are not expecting to be at the same level that the top uh, companies in the world. Yes. But of course, there is a niche of market that can be covered with the local uh, uh, assemblers. And, uh, and, and that is uh, something that will happen uh, very soon. But Miguel mentioned that started a couple of years ago. However, it's not easy to, to have that level of investment and how to warranty the uh, the production volumes in this uh, uh, market that one day you need to have one line and the next month you need to have triple capacity for the same customer. So yeah. the, the response level that uh, the American or Asian companies are still much better than the local ones. But uh, for some specific segments, of course, the local companies can, can do that. Yeah, uh, I'm talking about the culture that you were talking, also the big ones still uh, improving on that, having more people focused to take care of their people, how to mm. to, to create a, a better relationship, networking between the areas. So that is, is something that uh, we are uh, working very hard uh, together because there are some regulations, the NAM 35, that is the government is is, is procuring to avoid the stress in, 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 in the companies. Uh, mm -hmm. So now the, the employees uh, can get a medical living because if they are overstressed. Mm -hmm. So it's something that the, the companies is taking care of. Yeah, it's a mature industry, isn't it? It's, you know, we've had an EMS industry in um, in Mexico for what twenty five years now, and it's um, it's grown aggressively, and it you know it seems to be having a very good run at the moment and continuing to grow. So you did you feel that, that, that maturity that companies to be there. that have thirty five years in the industry are working together. They are not competing to each other uh, face to face. All this industry in Mexico is working together with the government. Mm -hmm. and with, uh, with other governments, how to, to create the, the, the conditions to, to have mm -hmm. a, a long-term relationship with their customers. Yeah. So uh, we are participating in many associations like the Caminetti, the electronic chamber industry, the, the index, the Association of Maquila uh, Industry, IPC, SMTA, and of course, uh, the, the, the local association, the priority, is how to do a long-term relationship with the customers and how to work together to have the, the best benefit for customers. And is part of that building a supply chain ecosystem around the EMS industry? You know, when the EMS industry first arrived in Guadalajara, they brought a lot of suppliers down. Um, and, you know, part of the strategy was to develop domestic suppliers now we're seeing concerns about that in the US, we're seeing the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, all those things trying to encourage an ecosystem that's less Asia dependent um, on the generally around the supply chain. Is that having an, an impact in Mexico? Yeah, you know, the, the, the main worry that the industry had years ago, it was how to convert from a manufacturing country, just maquila country, into a, te mm -hmm. a technology country. So it was a lot of the chambers, companies, and government initiatives, how to develop technology and design, software, and, and other topics. So mm -hmm. right now, uh, the total solution that the companies are offering is vertical integrations mm -hmm. from design up to delivery to final customer. So that is something that it's, is being in place right now. Yeah. Also, at, at the beginning of uh, of the of the pandemic, uh, what we saw a lot in the industry was that many companies were trying to relocate their production from China. Right? They were trying to get out of China, but 
one of the main problems that they were having is they didn't have their technical information completed. And the, the Chinese company, they were not very willing to share the, the, the design files and everything so they can mm -hmm. kind of uh, build somewhere else. So many companies at that time, they were required for design services, kind of a reverse engineer or redesign mm -hmm. production. So uh, yeah, some companies uh, uh, kind of create alliances with the design houses to try to get the business at the end of the day. And, and uh, what we were trying to do is just pull more business that from companies that were trying to relocate this. And I saw many companies working with design and redesign just to get the business from China. So, and yeah. are we seeing are we seeing design muscle available in a growing amount in Mexico now? Is there are there more design industrial engineering um, technology design companies? And where are they? Everywhere. <laughs> Very good. That's the ideal location. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't, have, you know, after the last few years with the component shortages and everything, right? I mean, it, we're into second quarter 2023, you know, it doesn't seem, you know, the stories you hear don't seem as stressed and dire anymore, but uh, maybe, or did we just get used to it? Is it has, what's <laughs> your sense? Has it gotten improved? Is it just the new normal that you just kind of work through it? Or do you see things improving? And related to that would be the logistics and the movement of the uh, of, of the components into Mexico. How How is that currently? You want to show you? Your <laughs> well, what I have seen is that it's basically the same. Right now, if you get an award for a project, you have to wait at least the, what the what manufacturer lead time is saying, 49 to 52 weeks if you have a, a kind of a, a, a optimistic way of seeing, right? But what we're doing is, of course, we're trying to look for the inventory, where the inventory is located, of course, look for alternative components. But if you see that what is happening is, if the inventory is available, you will get hands on the whole thing. You won't just place an order and, and ask for split deliveries. You need to, to get the whole thing, right? So oh, yeah. that's something that is, it was new for me uh, when I started uh, 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 Microfab, because I was used to work with uh, maybe uh, open order split deliveries, but right now we need to be very aggressive, right? You need to be able to deliver product to the customer. What I have seen also is time to market right now is very important. Time to market for uh, emerging uh, companies is very important. We work a lot with uh, uh, some uh, uh, scale up companies, so mm. we know that that's priority one for them. So we are able to grab the whole thing, the, the whole inventory that they have in order to guarantee that we're gonna be able to make it on time. And of course, help our customers and our partners to, to launch the product in time. Yeah, it's still quite scrappy, isn't it? You've got to work hard to get those last two or three components that mean you can ship the product. Uh, and you know, in my opinion, it depends of the company muscles, how big you are, mm -hmm. how many push you can do, how well is your planning? Because uh, uh, of course, uh, there are companies like has hundreds or thousands of people pulling material, mm -hmm. and of course, trying to reduce the the, the PPVs on the material cost. I've been talking with some guys that for them, their job is just to get approvals to compensate the, the, the price variance, they come on. Why you are not pushing to do a better planning of your production? Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, always to, have, to have the right balance between inventory of finished good, inventory of raw material and production planning is the key. So yeah. according to how much, what is your maturity of your product and of your company in the market, that is going to be representing better planning and better production results. And of course, in better manufacturing costs. And it's not only the project, the problem in Mexico, that problem is around the world. Yeah. So yeah. how you can align your procurement uh, and your forecasting of, of, of the material is gonna be, who is gonna be the winner of the some uh, orders at the end for governments, for uh, broadcasting companies, for uh, internet companies that are changing all the infrastructure. It, it, that depends on how well and how risky is your planning for production. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah inventory management has become a huge key factor in success, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Ivan, as you know, your company represents a lot of different brands and, you know, various products and software type things. So talk about, is are there new technologies that you're seeing that you're finding particularly exciting and helpful to, to, to the emerging industry? Uh, well, basically a little bit of everything right now, the, all the machines are having more AI, artificial, artificial intelligence into the systems how to do the closed loop between the different models, how to improve the, or to the self-improvement of the, of the programs of the machines. And of course, how to automate a process using external, like the cobots. Uh, so here in my desk, I have a, a new uh, AI model that got for my robot. Uh, so I was talking this morning with, with my people that they are asking me to have more demos for the robot. So the, these collaborative robots, I have 12 already in, in Mexico running different applications just for demonstration. Mm -hmm. Okay, how many in addition you need? Because uh, 12 uh, demonstrations of different applications is, 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 is a lot for a country like Mexico. Yeah. So uh, there is a lot of requests to do more and more and more. So uh, all the companies have good news. The SMTA in, in Ciudad Juarez is going to have in the next days a, a webinar to talk about the use of the artificial intelligence into the AOIs. So it's a, a, a collaboration between several the top the, the top four or five companies in the in the market is going to to do that uh, uh, seminar. Um, and the same happened with the pick and place with the robots with the conveyors also. Right now, the models, how to communicate with the pick and place and to do the, the discard and the auto setup and everything. Mm -hmm. Everything is being uh, uh, moved into the, the use of artificial intelligence. Okay. And Miguel, what are you saying? You, you deal with a lot of the companies down there. What, what excites you? Well, uh, what it really excites me the most is, uh, and uh, if this is going to maybe sound like a commercial, but at the beginning, when I started working at Macrofab, uh, have you seen the platform? It's an amazing tool uh, for me. I mean, you can get a, an instant quote uh, as you can input your data. You can just drag your files into the platform, get a quote instantly, uh, and, and it will tell you the lead time of the material, the stock availability. You can get your credit card out, put the number, and order to the platform. Uh, once you order to the platform, uh, the platform will place the orders directly for that company that has a stock and you you only have to worry when the materials start arriving to the company, you get the materials and you send them to a factory location. So for me, that was pretty amazing how they managed to uh, first uh, connect and integrate uh, the platform uh, or platform with Altium and then to connect with some other uh uh, stock companies like uh, Octopart and 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 DEP yeah. and Mauser, so mm. we can know the stock in real time, the pricing, and grab the stock as you are quoting and placing the order. So there is a lot of uh, programming behind the platform. I mean, there's a a big team of of programmers, uh, product managers, uh, designers, and everything, mm -hmm. not just to satisfy the needs of of the user, the end user, which is kind of the designer whoever is ordering. Uh, the PCBA, but also for our internal use, we can have all the data there, get mm -hmm. analyzed the data and start extracting information from that data. So, yeah. See what's going on. Yeah, yeah, two comments there. Well, one comment and one que question. Comment is, yeah, yeah, it does sound a bit like a commercial, but it is an interesting <laughs> use of the uh, of, of AI and digital transformation in, in the supply chain, which I think is equally important to the digital transformation that you're seeing on the factory floor are they are they using an ai engine in there to to make some of those decisions or is it mainly you know kind of classic math style programming some parts are already very uh automate, automated uh not quite sure how the algorithm is, is 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 working but i know that there is a lot of uh arithmetic and, and, and programming behind uh, how mm. the, the platform is deciding where to buy the material and how to cost each part. Yeah. 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 
You know, what I got from that was that it's the software is making the hardware manufacturing less hard, right? It it uh, it helps make that happen. You know, I just listened to a podcast recently. It, it just came to mind. We're talking about the AI and when somebody's talking about the quantum computing over how that'll develop in the next 10 years. He says, what we're getting with digitalization, he says, in the next 10 years, once we achieve that, he says, it's going to just blow it away. So there's a whole nother wave of change and improvement yeah. coming that'll be amazing to watch. Hey, Ivan, I did want to follow up on a point with you and 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 maybe Miguel, you have an opinion too. Is there anything, any policies or initiatives within Mexico from the from the that would be supportive of the industry that's needed that you think is a you mentioned some things with the government, the collaboration that's going on. Is is there anything that would be helpful or policies or initiatives that you think could be beneficial? Yeah, there are some initiatives from the federal government, but of course, the first advice that we can do uh, to all the new companies is to be in contact uh, with the uh, index, the Association of uh, Maquila Industries of Exporting. Mm -hmm. They have the relationship in every state, so they can uh, put into consideration what are the benefits of the region, and you can get the best, uh, uh, the best of the best yeah. uh, that you're looking for. Okay. Miguel, any opinions? Or you see any, even from the state level, right? So, yeah, it will depend. Uh, mostly it will depend on, on each state. Of course, we have uh, some generalities, but it will depend on, on each state what, uh, or, or how, how they can be of help, uh, of help for each individual, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And they say the um, electronic manufacturing industry is. As absolutely key and fundamental in in you know in most regions. Certainly, the conversations I've had in Jalisco confirm that it's a uh, strategic importance to the to the region, and I think that's true throughout Mexico. Yeah. Listen, gentlemen, we're going to have to wrap, but in closing, let me just ask a final question. Let me put your you know get your crystal ball out. Tell me, what do you think? What do you expect uh, within the industry for the remainder of this year? Um, well, the total investments uh, in this industry in Mexico expected for, for this year is $1 billion. So uh, we expect that, uh, well, the final number for Q1, it was like a, a 20% of the total planning investment. So we expect to have the 80% of the investment in the last three quarters. Mm. That's fair. That's fair. Miguel, what do you see as the um, as the opportunities and challenges for the remainder of the year? Yeah, I agree. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, what I have personally been looking at is that more companies are, are, are knocking on the doors and trying to figure out uh, where should they be as establish their operation. They should acquire someone or, or merge with someone. So this is something that we are living like. Uh, it's the constant thing that is happening. We are seeing like, hey, this company is sending operations here. Where they're from? Taiwan. So yeah, we're looking at a lot of those companies yeah. just arriving. They keep arriving to Guadalajara and also to Monterrey. Yeah, so, so more players. Just out of curiosity, with with you see the new coming in, is there still for people who aren't in Mexico yet who might be looking at that? I mean, is it? Still, great opportunity. Is I mean, we've been talking about some of the challenges with labor and and all that. Um, is there still sufficient down there that you can still absorb quite a bit more from from other regions? I see Ivan nodding his head. Yes, so. I think there's. I think there's lots of scope for growth. Do you? I do. I, you know uh, what is happening that we have a lot of inter internal migration from the southeast states. Uh, mm -hmm. Traditional, there are states like Sinaloa, Veracruz, uh, that most of the students over there migrate into, in, into the traditional stockpile to get a better uh, job opportunities. Yeah. And that is something that uh, will still happen. So, of course, we, we, most of the companies, they have open positions because always there are a realignment of the people, people moving between companies. But this industry is one of, of the industries with lower uh, turnover uh, rates in, in Mexico. So, and of course, a mature country with more than 30 years of experience in electronic assembly, it's easy to set up a new operation. It's easy to, to transfer products into the current company. Mm -hmm. uh, there are new companies setting up new operations from scratch, buying a, land, a piece of land, 
There are others that are using big uh, industrial parks to setting up to buy or lease buildings. And there are others that uh, are transferring products into the current EMS or others using the shelter program into the big industrial park associations. So there are many uh, uh, models that companies looking to establish manufacturing in Mexico can use. Good. Excellent. Well, that that's we, we're going to end on that positive note because that was very good. That's uh, Chamber of Commerce kind of stuff right there. So uh, <laughs> it was good. Um, listen, uh, thank you both. I think you know Phil and I have both been very big, you know, uh, advocates for manufacturing in Mexico. I think you know Guadalajara. I still think is one of the top three places on the planet to to do electronics manufacturing. It really is, and, and it's a fun a city to be in. And a great city, yes. So, um, so gentlemen, thank you for your time today. Thank you for, for sharing your insights. And hopefully we can catch up again in the future. Thank you, Eric. Thank you.